Good morning once again. And once again, I'd like to thank the Stoles for being here this morning. That was really a blessing. I don't get to hear brass enough, and that was just wonderful. When the uh, pastor asked me to take this appointment for him, I knew what tomorrow was going to be. What's tomorrow? And I sought the Lord for a message on, on that subject. And we don't put a whole lot of emphasis here since we're not a Sunday-keeping church. But that doesn't diminish our need for celebrating the Lord's resurrection. Amen. For that was his victory over the grave. And we should relish that and celebrate that because it should be our victory over sin through his power. Shall we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, as we come here today, we realize that we need your presence in our lives. We love you, dear Lord. We love your son Jesus that was willing to give himself for our salvation. And now we realize that with finite minds we are limited in our intellect and we ask you to fill this sanctuary with your Holy Spirit. I ask you to guide my every thought, word, and action up here that your name may be glorified and that the hearers will get out of this message what you have for each and every one of them. This I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. When Jesus came from the cross and he came out of that grave, was it all over? A lot of people think it was. But I don't think it was. But it should teach us something. When he gained that victory, we realize everything that he gave up to come down here. And he gave up a lot. What did he reveal to us with that act? I saw Jackie's lips move to it. How much he loved us. How much do you treasure that love. What is going on in your life because of that love? Each and every one of us is here for a different reason this morning. But I hope it's all in response to his love. There may be some here that are here for wrong motives. There may be some young people are here only because their parents dragged them here. But I hope that they realize it's his love that makes a change in us. But what's changing in us? The title of this message this morning is What Separates Us? And think as we go through here, as we open up his word to different scripture, if there's something there that you're not following his guidance on. Now, if you received an invitation to a royal wedding or perhaps a presidential inauguration, you open that up in the mail, how would you respond to it? Would you want to go to it? <laughs> Definitely. Now I talked to a, one man that said he was invited to, to a presidential inauguration and he didn't approve of the man that was being inaugurated, but he was going to go because he wanted to experience that event. 
And God is planning an event for us that he wants us to experience. Go with me to Luke chapter 14. And we're going to see a parable in Luke chapter 14 that the Lord brought forward. Luke chapter 14, we're going to start in verse 16. I still hear some pages turning. Luke 14, 16. Then said he unto him, A certain man made a what? A great supper. He wasn't just inviting a couple friends over and putting on a meal. He was making a great supper, and he had bade many. Verse 17, And he sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. And what? They all. How many? All. all. With one consent, began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground, and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee, have me excused. Now, I don't know, but I believe that majority of you that are over 21 have bought real estate in your lives. Have any of you ever bought real estate sight unseen? No. You want to know the value of it. This, this society was based on agriculture, so there's a good chance when he bought that land, he wanted a good piece of ground that he could grow crops on to sell. You know he checked it out, because he certainly wouldn't want to go out there after he bought it and found a piece of stony ground that he had to move a bunch of rocks away to do anything with, or just poor soil. So this is kind of a lame excuse, isn't it? Now, let's go on, and then we're going to come back and hit on these things a little bit more. V verse 19. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to prove them. I pray, have me excused. Now, if you had a farm, and you wanted to get things done quicker, you'd probably go out and buy some implements, probably a tractor. Now, would you just say, uh, I want to buy a tractor and write a check? and have them deliver something you had never checked out? And yet that's what he's trying to intimate here when he says, I've got to check, go check out these oxen. Anybody in their right mind would have made sure this was quality stock in the first place. That these are muscular ox, that they're going to do the job that he wants them to do. And here he says something foolish like this. And another said, I have married a wife. Therefore, I cannot come. What? Now, don't you think that if you had received this invitation and you told that person, I got married, can I bring my spouse along with me? He would have said, absolutely. I'd love to meet her. But that's not what this guy said. I got married, so I can't come to your party. I think that that is not only rude, but it's foolish. Verse 21. So that servant came and showed his Lord these things. Now remember, we just see the three excuses here. But everyone turned him down. That word all in there was very important for this parable. Then the master of the house being angry, and I think if any of you were throwing a big party and everybody turned you down, you'd be angry too, wouldn't you? He said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in hither the poor, the maimed, the halt, and the blind. 
In other words, if the ones, my chosen people, say that they don't want to come, go find the street people. Go to find those that have physical disabilities and are in real need and invite them to this party. So the servant went out and he did that. And in verse 22, he comes back and the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded and yet there is room. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. That word compel, that's a pretty strong word, isn't it? Now, do you think he was just forcing them? I don't think so. I think that servant went out and everybody he met on the street said, my Lord has provided a fantastic feast. You should see the spread that he's got there and he wants you to come. This is going to be an event that will be memorable. It will be memorable forever. Come on in. Have you ever experienced anything like that? Did somebody invite you to a party? And you didn't even know it was taking place? Verse 24. For I say unto you that, how many? None of those men which were bidden shall taste my supper. His chosen guests had turned him down. The question is, are we going to do the same thing? His chosen guests was his chosen people, Israel. If we study the Old Testament, we see so many of their failings. They were asked to be obedient at the, mount, at the foot of Mount Sinai. They said, all you say, we will do. And they failed. He asked them to keep his commandments. And if we go to the book of Revelation, we see that we, the remnant, are asked to be commandment-keeping people. They were told in the Old Testament that they were to be a kingdom of priests. And if we look in the New Testament, Christ's followers are supposed to be a kingdom of priests. We're to be taking his word out into the world around us. They were also told the things that they should do. And you remember in the Old Testament, how did they look at the Samaritans? They hated them. They despised them. Did Israel take the word to the world? No, they became exclusive. May I suggest to you that we as Adventists have all this truth that many of the other denominations don't have and that we are in danger of being exclusive as well. Amen. Go with me to the book of Romans. Romans chapter 8. Romans 8, and we're going to look at verse 38 in Romans 8. Romans 8, 38 says, For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from what? The love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now that's a pretty comprehensive list, isn't it? And a lot of people think that because they have that list that nobody 
is going to be lost that says they're a follower of Jesus. But all it says is that these things can't separate it, us from his love. It doesn't mean that we can't be separated from him. And that's what some of the things we're going to look at this morning is how we can be separated from him. See, he loves the sinner. And all of us are sinners. So each and every one of us here, he loves with a love that we can't even comprehend. But he hates the sin. He wants us to respond to that love with a change in our hearts. So what is it that separates us from him? It's sin. Cheryl's father, Brother Mac, had a favorite verse. I've mentioned it here before when I spoke to you. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So what is in your life, what is in my life that is separating us from God? Now the first guest we saw invited to this party, he was uh, full of self, he was not thoughtful of others, and that reminds me of a verse we see in 2 Timothy. Go to 2 Timothy, because 2 Timothy chapter 3 has a list in it that Paul gave us that I think is important for us today because it's an end times list. And are we living in end times? <laughs> Amen. 2 Timothy 3, verse 2 says, For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Is this not what that man was exhibiting a love for his own self. He wasn't thinking about the one who had invited him to this great feast. He was only thinking about himself. Covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents. We don't see that today, do we? <laughs> Unthankful, unholy. Verse 3, without natural affection. Do we see cold-heartedness in the world today? Truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, people that just can't control themselves. Fierce, despisers of those that are good. Traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Now we're just talking about all those pagans, those heathens out there, aren't we? No, verse 5 says, having a form of godliness. These are professors of Christianity, professors of those that believe in this God that we serve. They profess to be godly, but they are denying the power thereof and he says, from such, turn away. Now, is it possible that one or more of these traits is separating you or I from him? That's what we need to be examining today. Now, our second guest, he was allowing himself to be distracted by the things of this world. Now, after all, just think for him, those oxen, Five yoke of oxen. Just think of all the land preparation he could do. And if they were good oxen, he'd do this job quickly, efficiently. That would mean more crops. More crops mean more profits. So he'd make more money. Are any of us too interested in making more money? Go with me to Luke chapter 19. There we find a story about a man who was interested in more money until he came in 
contact with the Savior. Luke 19, we're going to go right to verse 1 there. Luke 19, verse 1. And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho, and behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans, and he was rich. Now, I believe that the majority of us here this morning know what publicans are, but for any of you out there that don't, these were the tax collectors. Now these were Israelites, but they were collecting tax for the Romans. These were traitors to their nation. And they were making a lot of money because Rome said, I want this much tax from you. Whatever else you get, you can keep. And they boosted it up, so they kept plenty. So you can see why the standard Israelite despised them and thought very little of them. Verse 3, And he, Zacchaeus, sought to see Jesus, who he was. Who he was. Who was this Jesus? And could not for the press, because he was little of stature, and he ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste, come down, for today I must abide at thy house. Now, do we see anywhere here anybody saying, hey, hey Jesus, that, that funny little man up in the tree is Zacchaeus? We don't see that. And I believe this is just a sign of the divinity of Jesus. He looked up in the tree and he saw that little sinner despised by many of the crowd that was following him. And he said, I came to seek and save the lost. And this chief of sinners up here is one of those that I am coming to seek and save. Hey, chief sinner, come on down here. I need to talk to you, young man. Now, Zacchaeus came down, and in verse 6 it says, He made haste and came down and received him with a somber heart, joyfully. This teacher that I've heard so much about, called me by name. He wants to come be with me. Those people don't want any part of me, but he wants to be with me. So he was overjoyed about the whole thing, wasn't he? Now, in verse 7 it says, and when they, who? The Pharisees, right? the religious leaders and the others out there, when they saw it, they all murmured, saying that he was gone to be a guest of a man that is a sinner. Was Zacchaeus a sinner? Absolutely. That's why Jesus was seeking him, right? The problem lies with the Pharisees not realizing that they too are sinners. How is it with us? Do we think just because we come here on Sabbath morning that we're no longer sinners and that we're better than all these people out there? Jesus doesn't want us to see it that way. He wants us to reveal our love to those people out there, to draw them to him, to bring them into his house, to reach out to those sinners so we will not be exclusive. Verse 8, And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. 
do we see any indication in here that Jesus asked him to do this? No. When Jesus went and had that meal at Zacchaeus' home and talked to Zacchaeus, he came under conviction. Have you ever come under conviction that you need to make right with those out there that you have wronged? It was about five years after I became an Adventist. Uh, most of you know I went on a, a government contract in England and I was over there when I came under conviction that there needed to be some major changes in my life. And like I said, I was an Adventist for about five years when this happened to me. Communication then wasn't quite like it is today, so I couldn't just pick up a phone easily and call these people. So I sat down and wrote some letters that were very difficult to write because I had taken advantage of a lot of people because I was very selfish in those days, very self-centered. And I wasn't beyond taking advantage of people and taking from them. So I not only wrote letters, I wrote some checks out too. And thankfully, the majority of those people that I wrote to and sent money to responded back that they had forgiven me. And I had prayed about it and the Lord had forgiven me. And so I had a very light heart at that time. Have you thought about those that you've hurt and asked the Lord what you should do about it? Verse 9. And Jesus said unto him, This day salvation come to this house for so much as he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. Now he was a son of Abraham and the New Testament tells us that we are all sons and daughters of Abraham and salvation can come to our home. Zacchaeus didn't want anything, much less his wealth, to stand between himself and Jesus, his Savior. What separates us? Now let's consider our third guest. If you remember, he didn't ask to be excused. He just refused. Now, in my estimation, that is just about as rude as you can be. Somebody asks you to a big party and you just say, heck no, I'm not going. You just don't do that, do you? He was thoughtful and self-centered. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 15 was read in your hearing today. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 15. And that he died for how many? All. He died for all. That they, those he died for, which live, should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. What did it cost Jesus to come down here? It cost him everything. An extremely high price. The pen of inspiration says he could not see beyond the tomb. So when he was hanging up there on that cross, actually ever, ever since he was getting ready to go into Gethsemane, and the Father was pulling away from him, and our sins were laid upon him, he didn't know the outcome. Now could he have come down off of that cross? Yes, he could have said, no, I don't want this. 
but he wanted you and you and you and me. He wants us there. He gave everything. That price was an infinite price he paid. And Paul here is telling us because of that price, we should not continue to live for ourselves. We should be thankful for that gift and decide to live for him. Are we dying to self daily? That's what we should be doing. Turn to Matthew 10. And we're going to look into our third person, this man that marries, a little bit more. Because we're going to look at families. Because why does a man marry? Why does a woman marry? What reason? Love. Love brings us together, doesn't it? And lack of love can tear us apart. So this man, he, was, he had a, a good thing going for him. He had found this woman of his dreams. He had gotten married. But we have to be careful about that as well. Matthew chapter 10, and we're going to look at verse 35. Matthew 10, verse 35. For I am come to set man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And that man's foes shall be they of his own household. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. Is there anyone here today who has put their parents or their spouse or their children ahead of him? There are many spouses that like to think they're first in your life. But it's our duty to put him first in our lives. And our spouses, our other loved ones, secondary. And I want to emphasize secondary. Because he's first, they're second, you're down here. You should put them first. Only after him. But they should still be a high priority in your life. A year and a half ago, my eldest brother passed away from lung cancer. I fear for his salvation. Before he passed away, he says, what should I do? And I said, well, if it were me, I'd get down and spend some time on my knees and ask him to reveal to you those sins that you have not confessed. Before he passed away, he told me he had done that. But I don't know how God saw that. Was it just a deathbed confession? Or did, he, did his heart really change? And the reason I'm worried about it is because my brother Max, he wasn't a Seventh-day Adventist, but he was an Episcopalian and he had been taking his religion very seriously and he had been witnessing to others. But he got too legalistic about it with his own family. And so his wife gave him an ultimatum. Max, you can have your religion or you can have our family. And he had two beautiful boys. 
he walked away from the religion and joined his family. And I don't believe that he was ever in a church again except for a wedding. And I know how my now deceased sister-in-law felt about religion. I had to watch very closely the things I said in their home. What is our choice? Do we let loved ones separate us from him? Now, Mrs. White penned in Christ's Object Lessons, page 223, and it's in your meditation. The lesson is for all time, and that lesson she's talking about there is this parable. We are to follow the Lamb of God whithersoever he goeth. His guidance is to be chosen his companionship valued above the companionship of earthly friends. Christ says, and he quotes the verses we just read, He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Matthew 10, 37. And it goes on to say, around the family board, and for you young people, the family board is referring to the dinner table. A fam around the family board, when breaking their daily bread, many in Christ's day repeated the words, blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. But Christ showed how difficult it was to find guests for the table provided at infinite cost. Those who listened to his words, and these are the Pharisees again, knew that they had slighted the invitation of mercy. To them, worldly possessions, riches and pleasures were all absorbing. With one consent, they had made excuse. And I would like to encourage you to pick up Christ's Object Lessons. That's probably one of my favorite books that Mrs. White wrote. And read chapter 18, Go Into the Highways and Hedges. And I think you'll gain a, quite a blessing from that. These Pharisees were aware of this parable and it was being applied to them. How does it apply to you? Turn with me to our second scripture verse today, Mark 12, verse 30. Mark 12, verse 30. Where he was asked, what is the great commandment? Mark 12, verse 30. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with what? All, All your heart. And with what? all your soul with what all. all your mind with what all. all your strength how many of us are putting any effort into that what's the subject i mean what's the verb in this sentence here love love is the active word here and what's the subject? The Lord thy God. He loved us enough to allow his son to come down here as a poor blue collar carpenter and then minister for everybody else for three and a half years and then die on that cross. He loved us totally. But he's asking us to respond to that love. When you have met a love in your life, do you not respond to them? So we need to do the same thing. We need to respond with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We need to put everything into it because he put everything into it. And he's offering us a gift that you can't put a price on. 
an eternity with him, the one that loves you best. So our last questions have to include, what is it in my life that I'm putting ahead of God? He's the one that loves me more than any other. He's the one that has given his all for me. What am I willing to give for him? May I suggest to you that every one of us needs to search our heart and let nothing separate us from the love of God Amen. so that we will not be a part of that group that misses out on that last supper, that, that wonderful banquet in heaven. Amen.